What do you mean you don't have notes for this one? Are you serious? Are you? I didn't not... even watch. Really? I'm gonna completely bluff my way through this whole thing. Just wing it. Just I mean, yeah. I mean, how are, how hard could it be? Really? Hey, just check who's doing, who's doing the recap today. You got it. So. Shoot. <laughs> yeah. It'd be helpful if you watched it. <laughs> it may, well, or it just makes here, here you go. Just be in there and be like, uh, yeah. So they uh, they spend forty three minutes talking about stuff that doesn't matter, and then they remind us that the shadows are here, and then that's the end of the episode. That's what happens. Let's talk about it, Joe. That's been what's happened for the last three episodes of Babylon Five. Yeah. So why not yeah. this one? Hi YouTube. Hi, you caught us uh, in media race once in, again. Right. Right. Yeah. We were uh, just chit chatting as people do before podcasting. Um, welcome to our show. He watched the episode, by the way. I did. I, I really did. I did. I promise. We just have unstructured it. notes this time. So. Yes. Yes. Well, yeah. as, as usual is the case because Jeff and I don't look at each other's notes before the show. Cause that's a part of it. Anyway. Right. Um, welcome in. You guys are awesome. Uh, we love you guys today. We are recording our episode on spider in the web, which I'm what inspired a really fun uh no doubt song in like 1996 was that 96 I, I think so that was, I, fun. was it 96 I think so that's probably because ironically yeah. I was living in the wastelands of San Diego in 1996 <laughs> when that when that record came out I just I re, so 1996 97 people that went to school in 1996 graduated in 97 this would have been my group I was working at Walt Disney World at the time. Wow. That's and back then, I don't know that they still do it today, but back then they had a thing through like April and May called Grad Night, which is one of their special ticket events where they keep the park open late. But it was only for graduating seniors, graduating high school seniors. And it was supposed to be, you know, kind of locked down. It was going to be a safe environment. But they played popular music of the day, and it was a lot of no doubt. It was a lot of no doubt in the late 90s. That time of power pop and ska was right oh supreme. Gosh. Right, right. A lot of, I mean, any boy band, all of them, all of the boy bands were there. Like, it was nuts. Anyway, we're not here to talk about all that, Jeff. We're not. We're in here fact, to, huh? In fact, we're here to talk about something a lot, a lot cooler than that. That was earlier in the 90s, too, <laughs> than that. Uh, we're here to talk about a spider in the web. This is the sixth episode of season two. I think so, yeah. And we're trucking right along through season mm -hmm. two, and thank God, because, man, uh, we're, we'll get into all that. But uh, sixth episode, season two, we were talking about this is our behind-the-scenes recording. Jeff and I are going to record our podcast. You guys are watching along as we do that, which means you guys get all the behind-the-scenes. You get the outtakes. You get the rabbit trails. You get the full conversations before Jeff and I kind of go, might should edit that one. I don't know if I want to put that one out there on the podcast or not. Turns out it's going out on YouTube anyway. So anyway, that's what you guys are getting ready to watch. Um, yeah, I had one a couple weeks ago. I think I edited like 14, like it was a substantial amount of time, like 14 to like 18 you? minutes. It's like, nope, they don't need... I don't need this one. <laughs> that whole conversation. I mean, I used to I used to edit a, a different podcast where I was in the editing chair and the co-host that I had, he used to get so mad at me when I'd edit out like entire pieces of conversations that we why are you editing me, man? And I'm like, because you drove you just droned on and on yeah. and on and on about it. Like the like, point it. was made in 40 seconds. We talked for almost 20 more minutes. Right. right. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So, and I, you know, and I promised, like, I never changed the context of what he, or like the exactly. for what he was saying. It was just, I had to tighten it up. There was one time I took it out altogether because it was just entirely inappropriate. Anyway, now what you guys are here to, here to listen to, uh, once again, we're here to talk about this show. So, uh, Jeff, if you don't mind, Hey guys, like subscribe, all that sort of stuff, comment down below. We'll talk back to you as well. And, uh, let's go, Jeff. Let's do this. It's my first time. You're new here, aren't you? First time. Boom! Welcome to Babylon 5 for the first time. Not a Star Trek podcast. My name is Jeff Aiken, and I'm watching Babylon 5 for the first time. 
And I'm Brent Allen, and I'm also watching Babylon 5 for the first time. We are veteran Star Trek podcasters watching Babylon 5 for the very first time, searching for those Star Trek-like messages, trying to dig them out of this series, applying that analytical lens that we have gained over our years in podcasting about Star Trek, and ultimately trying to decide if we even like the series at all or not. And while this is not a Star Trek podcast, we are Star Trek podcasters. And so those references are going to make their way into the show. In fact, I think a lot of them might actually make them into this show. It's going to be a challenge because Brent and I play the rule of three. We each only get three a piece references to Star Trek through the entire episode. Bartering is an option and may possibly be on the table this time. And I will, I will make you guys a promise. I know there was an episode a couple of weeks ago where I was just like, I don't even care. I don't care. I'm going to use all the Star Treks and then I'm going to use all of them and I'm going to use all of yours. I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to abide by the rules of this time, Jeff. That's good. I had to hit a lot of buttons. It was like two weeks ago and I had to hit all yeah. these buttons because you just kept going. I'm like, yeah. Oh, I, no, like, I used all of mine and then I used all of yours and I think I used some like rollover buzzes from previous episodes. <laughs> It was an old, uh, old, what was that, Vonage or AT&T or something rollover plan that we have. Right, right, <laughs> which I don't think really works, you know, but whatever. It's kind of our thing. We can make whatever work. We have the most incredible community out there that listens to us, who watches us on YouTube, and I've got a couple things I want to share from them. The first one is from our Twitter at Babylon first. You can follow us there. There's nothing for me to say on this one. This is just one for you to go and look at sometime, but Carl's web at web Carl's with a K on Twitter and Gail at B five Raven shared some super cool, some amazing cosplay photos of them as uh, different uh, instances, but as Vorlon. They were on stage Whoa. at cons in the late nineties. Yeah. As Kosh and Borlons. Super cool. Super cool. Okay. I have a question. I've been thinking about this recently. Are there Babylon five specific conventions? Like I know there are Stargate conventions. Obviously there are Star Trek conventions, but are there actual Babylon five conventions out there? And if there aren't, should Why? there be? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe we should, hmm. Is the fandom not large enough to handle its own convention and come together? Sounds like we might have a task in front of us. Yes, and we have like two years to get it planned and operated because we wouldn't be allowed to go to it until then anyway. <laughs> right, we got plenty. We can go and we can just tell people, this is the Babylon 5 conference to discuss up to season two, episode 20, 21. <laughs> Nothing after that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get let's see here well no see i can't even like i was gonna say like we'll get like the dude that played jinxo and we'll yeah. get the dude but i don't know if those guys come back or not that's right we don't like, i don't know <laughs> well we could probably no i was gonna say we don't even know if he did yeah i i, I don't know if they came back or not <laughs> Well, I have, I have three other comments i want to share but they all have a common theme and this is one we've talked about a couple of times but these Three people in the recent times have shared the impact that Babylon 5 has made oh, on their lives. Cool. Yeah. these the, They all kind of came in a succession and it really hit me. So I kind of grouped them all together. On our YouTube, Violent Silence shared that it was something that got me really interested in screenwriting. JMS did a great book on it that featured the script for a pivotal season two episode. Not as dramatic of a change or impact is for other people, but it did lead to me being a harsher critic. Like it didn't kill star Wars for me, but it meant I couldn't miss or ignore the faults in it. Like I did hey. as a kid. Then on our Twitter, Alyssa, who has an incredible Twitter name at wacky Vorlon. And she says she's had that name from Twitter, like since the nascent days of Twitter. So I'm good. Good on you, Alyssa. But she says when she still could have just been at Alyssa, right? Except <laughs> it was still or Alyssa one. Like right. it was just yeah, right. they were all out there, <laughs> but still picked wacky Vorlon. I have I have a friend who's like at Josh, really? Yeah, or it's like at Josh W. I think is what it like. It's that like 
easy and simple. And because he was one of those like day tours. <laughs> I'll try this thing out. I mean, what it's got an egg. What could go wrong with a great egg? Right. Twitter is the great egg. It, yeah. I won't go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> well, Wacky Borlon, Alyssa says, Babylon 5 played a formative role in the development of my personal philosophy and ideals. I learned a great deal about how to live from the show. I got to tell you, Brent, I'm, I think it's amazing the show had this impact on people. I have not seen this yet, right? Like, Mm-hmm. What we have watched in this series so far would not teach me a lot about how to live. No. So I think we have a lot to look forward to. Yeah, Alyssa, it, if you could write back to us, tweet us or DM us if you want to do it that way, um, anything that you're comfortable being shared, uh, and tell us what it has, like how it has taught you to live or like what things it has taught you to live, keep it non-spoilers. Um but I'd be, I'd really be interested to know. Cause I'm kind of on this page with Jeff there of like, what exactly have you learned? Because, because Jeff, that is exactly what we're searching out in this show. Exactly. When we look for those star Trek, like messages, we're not trying to compare it to star Trek all the time. We're looking for those, those life messages that are, I think honestly should exist in most sci-fi at least somewhere. So yeah, agreed. Last one I've got through our website, Babylon five first.com. That's the number five in the word first.com. Nathaniel reached out. Nathaniel said, while I consider B five to be generally life changing and influencing, there's a particular dialogue between two ish characters in early season three that helped me deal with some of the effects of post-traumatic stress disorder. Unfortunately, I can't say more without spoilers. Thank Appreciate you, that, Daniel. But look forward to you reaching that section. I've heard similar stories from a number of fans, so I think you will find that many have been touched by B five in the way you describe Star Trek fans. That's cool. Yeah. And please reach out to us when we do get to that spot and say this is what I was talking about, because we're a whole season away from that. And while I would love to tell you that I will remember this. I cannot promise that that will be the case. So I would love to hear that. Um, and you know what they, uh, he, like he's, he mentions that we're kind of in a spot now, Jeff, where every once in a while we'll get a message from somebody who says, I've been waiting for you to get to this spot. Yep. And so it's kind of neat to know that there are still people waiting for us to get to more spots down the road. Uh, Cause we've started hitting those and it's like, it's like, Oh yeah, we know now we get it. We're with you. Yeah, we're also still so early, so early so in this early. series, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Jeff, you know, uh, along with our game, Rule of Three, we have another game that we like to play here at Babylon 5 for the first time, and that's where we try to guess what next week's episode is going to be about based on the title alone because we haven't read show descriptions or, you know, watched any trailers or anything like that. And this spot of the show, because that game happens towards the end of the episode, Uh, This is the spot where you and I take a look back at what we said last week that this week's episode was going to be about. So Jeff, this honestly might be the hardest thing we do every week because (laughs) I'm just trying to remember what we said, but Jeff, do you remember what you said? Spider in the web was going to be and how close do you think you were? I remember very much what I said because there was a, I mean, a fraction of a second that I thought I might be right. And then not at all. But I thought this was going to be um, Bester coming back and right. Bester being yeah. set up like, yeah. look what a good guy I am. I'm so great. You must be the people that there's something wrong with. So there's some psychor, sort of, kind of, and a psychop in this one. That's about as close as I got. What about you? I don't entirely remember what I said. Do you remember what I said? I don't. Come on, you get the recordings of these things. I think I, I, I remember kind of reasoning it out. Like a spider in the web is somebody who's sitting around waiting to make a kill. And I don't know where I went from that. Was it a Londo thing? I think I was. I, oh, that's what I said. This is going to be a Londo Jakar episode. Yeah. And it was not at all. So I'm going to just say I completely lost this one. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah. Yeah. We both. But I'll, you know, point yeah. one. I think point. like they were setting traps for each other. Like Londo was going to really get something over on Jakar. Or something right. It was like going to be kind of the, uh, the Jaquan F. 
yeah, yeah sort yeah. of a thing again yep and i that's not at all what this was about so i completely uh completely missed that one well hey now that we have talked about how completely wrong, wrong we were about this one why don't you brent remind us about what this episode was actually about Well, all right, a spider in the web, buckle up because this one is pretty thick. Talia Winters, hey, you guys remember her? She's our resident commercial telepath. Well, she has an old friend who's just come on board B5. Well, he's an old friend and an old mentor and a father figure and a client. His name is Taro Isogi. Isogi? Isogi. I think it's a Sogi. Mr. Miyagi. So a Sogi son. Yes, a Sogi son. Yeah. Uh, and he is the CEO, I think he was the CEO of a company called Future Corp, which is an earth-based business that does stuff. And he has come all the way out to Babylon 5 from Earth to meet with a representative from Mars government just one planet away so that they could negotiate a deal which could lead to Mars's independence from Earth which some people back on earth fear might actually be used to finance a new rebellion. But unfortunately someone else back home really doesn't like this idea either. And by back home, I mean somebody who's hiding out in the future wasteland that we now call San Diego. It's a mysterious woman and she's overseeing the commencement of a major operation that has 13 components deployed to Babylon five. We're all 13 at Babylon five. I, that's what I thought I heard, but I would be shocked if that was all anyway, regardless of that, there's also something called control that is at the center of the whole thing. Now, what this person we come to find out has actually deployed in this particular case is an assassin to take out a Sego. A Sogi. A Sogi. A Sogi. I think so. Yeah. All right. So, yep, that's right. Because my word letters got transposed here. A Sogi. He apparently got super cool Darth Sidious electric gloves for Christmas because he fries a Sogi with a grasp of his neck, but he does it right in front of Talia who stuns him with a mind scan and leaves him. And he leaves her without harming her at all. Talia isn't really sure what the image was that she saw in his mind, but Sheridan and Garibaldi promised to protect her. She's going to need it because the bad guy was just ordered by control to take her out. Maybe her personal security guard is actually going to need it because while he gets taken out just as easily as a Sogi, Talia gets to scan this mind's this guy. Talia gets to scan this guy's mind again, and he starts to glitch. And this time, she can make out the image quite a bit better. It is a ship firing directly at the guy from his own point of view. You see, this guy, his name is Abel Horn. And Abel is now a space zombie. But when he was alive, he was one of the leaders of the Free Mars movement. But turns out he was killed in a battle when his ship was fired upon by an Earth ship. He has no other memories going on in his head right now, except for that one moment of his own death replaying again and again and again, which I think just kind of means it sucks to be a space zombie. Now, Sheridan finds out about this and suspects that he was part of something called Project Lazarus, which was a secret program where they would take dead or mostly dead people and turn them into sort of RoboCop Cylon type dudes. So the space zombie starts glitching all over the place and even goes to the Mars lady for help. He injures her, but he doesn't kill her. And when Talia comes to talk with her, space zombie goes after Talia one more time. And this time Talia gets an even deeper scan and she sees the moment where he woke up on the operating table being turned into RoboCop and there standing over him was a female psychop saying he's alive. He's alive. And he's ours, all ours. Well, that's really about as far as we get because Sheridan and company come in and they sparky gun him thing to death. That is until he activates his own self-destruct and he blows a, and he blows up real good. 
but you know, everyone got out of the room and they're totally not on a craft in the middle of space, which would have had a hole ripped in it. So everything's going to be fine. Just a little mess to sweep up. And speaking of a couple little messes to sweep up, there's just two more things I want to talk about before we get out of here. Number one, Garibaldi needs some more information from Sheridan on this whole project Lazarus thing. Cause he's needs to know Sheridan says it was a secret illegal organization ran out of the earth government called section 30 up. Uh, I'm sorry, Bureau 13, which is where we get a cut back to San Diego in the wastelands of that HQ place with Dr. F with the female Dr. Claw. She wants control to make sure that the Bureau hasn't been compromised by this whole thing. And then we find out that she is that psychop lady from the operation. And then we find out that she herself is deceased. <laughs> And lastly, speaking of Talia, it seems that her and Garibaldi have grown a little closer through this whole thing. Sure, we'll come back to that one in a future episode. But for now, that's the end. What a breath of fresh air this episode was. Right? Oh, God. We've had just a line of stinkers up to this. And I, I really... I enjoyed this. I was really thankful to be back to the earth and Mars stuff going on. We've been so shadows focused and have only been kind of like spinning the pieces on the board around the shadow stuff to actually have, have. we really been shadows focused. Well, like, so I say like we haven't moved any pieces around. We've just like been, Hey, right? look, at, look at this. As I spin it around. You can look at the different sides to it that we have, mm -hmm. but this moved some stuff. It reminded us of, you know, the whole earth thing and the, the, the Mars rebellion that was going on and it moved things forward a little bit. It expanded the world a little more. I just thought, mm -hmm. I thought it was really well done, but damn it, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> Sheridan is just, you know, I, I'm really into conspiracies and there's this rogue operation that does the things that we're not willing to do. And he's saying this, I'm just like, don't say it, don't say it. Don't bureau 13. Oh my God. <laughs> if this isn't a direct, like a direct star Trek, I'll say this is, this is definitely a uh, star Trek inspired by Babylon five yeah. moment here that, yeah, I need to, I need to apologize actually <laughs> to no, one. Do it, do it. I, I, ha oh. mm, I got in a pretty, this goes back a couple months. <laughs> A couple months ago, I got into a pretty... Has it been that long? It I has mean, been. we've had lots of conversations over the course of our time here. People like, you know, they ripped off Deep Space Nine. And I'm oh, like, I went to, I went to the mattresses that. with uh, Matthew Ignacia, retro uh, robot on um, on YouTube, but on Twitter, like I went to the mattresses mm -hmm. with him. And like, I, I was getting pretty cocky too with just like, oh yeah, a space station and a hole in space. So they're the same. And then this happened and I'm like, oh shoot. Oh no. Yeah. Maybe there's something to this. Yeah. I, you know, I don't remember if it was on this show or a different show that I was talking, but I can remember having a conversation with, um, a guy named Aaron, who is a writer on one of the current star Trek shows that are out there. And one of the things Aaron was saying was he does not read anybody else's writing mm. refuses to, because if, if he's reading that writing and then he's putting down his own stuff, he can't be a hundred percent sure that he didn't pick up an idea. Like even if he's not copying saying, Hey, let me steal that idea and put it in here or Hey, the idea of a rogue. Cause look, here's the thing. JMS does not own the market on rogue organizations. <laughs> true. True. You know what I mean? Like rogue or that a rogue organization is kind of a neat idea. Let's throw it in there. The fact that one is named Bureau 13 and the other one is Section 31, which, Jeff, go ahead and give us a buzz for both of us on this because this is completely the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Be but, I mean, the fact that they're so closely named is like, like yeah. the Ducat and the Ducat thing, I can kind of be like, okay, that's a coincidence. Mm -hmm. This one's like, that's really close. Yeah. I mean, literally, if it was Bureau Alpha Bravo, or even Bureau 86, 
you know, <laughs> okay, cool. But the, right. The, mm, wow. Wow. Uh, this yeah. is, this is, I think it was last week I was making fun of the vanilla ice thing, you know, vanilla ice and queen. Uh -huh. This, this is that exactly. Yeah, right. So it's, well, right. there's another eighth note to it. I mean, it's a 31, not a 13. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, you know, I mean, the only saving grace is, I mean, but section 31 didn't even come out till season six of deep space nine. Like it well, was I'm, so far into the run and it, I like, I don't know. I am tempted and I'm not going to do, it. I'm just going to say I am tempted to go down a path of like talking about what section 31 was and what it was intended for and what bureau 13 is. But I want to save that for another time because I don't know exactly what bureau 13 is. I was going to say, we don't know what bureau 13 is. We can talk about what section 31 is. Here's what I'll say from the information we know right now, the two, while both are rogue organizations operating within the government, um, I don't, wait a minute. Is section 31 a rogue organization? It's in the Starfleet charter. It is it's section it, right. 31 it's, of the charter. It's not actually a rogue organization. It is a black ops organization for sure, but they're not actively working against the Starfleet government and they're not working for their own betterment. They're actually like the things they do are for the betterment of that Based on what we get the feeling here, this Bureau 13 really is acting to either subvert the Earth Force government or potentially take it over or have Something. its own agenda. Yeah. And there's a there's a very different quality to those two things. But I mean, I can't get over the 1331 thing, man. Well, and, and so and, th th and this is just this is total Jeff with the tinfoil hat and the red yarn connecting everything back here because there's no there's no way this is tied but seriously it's bureau 13 and control yeah like, like yeah. Uh, there's a whole there's a whole season of discovery dedicated to control and i even did the little bit of research so this episode of babylon 5 occurs in march 2259 Discovery went and chased down control in 2257. No, it's so, not. So yeah, so my, oh, what my theory, my what my yeah. theory is, is that Burnham and crew are actually behind Bureau 13. And this is just, that's going to be the continuation, JMS's continuation of Babylon 5, that people are clamoring to get onto the CW and everything is actually going to be the crossover episode. Wait, wait, is it, is it Burnham and crew or is it Giorgio? Giorgio or, um, Tilly? Just, just straight up, straight up Lorca? Starfleet. Was it oh, Starfleet? Yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah. it's Prime Lorca yeah. that comes back and, and got. I don't know. Listen, but what what we have just discovered is is that Star Trek and Babylon Five occur in the same universe, side by side, and both exist. That's what we've well, just discovered. We proved it last last week with Barclays Holodeck program, right? For everything, and then this week that at the same time. Control is running all this stuff and control is out there trying to get the red angel to do some stuff and is taking over. I don't remember everything that happened in season two of discovery. That was a long time ago. Hey Jeff, you know what? What? This is not a star Trek podcast. I know See, this is why we have the game and this is like, we're right. It's two. I got two in there. I got one left, but okay, okay, uh, I'm going to ride this bad boy for a little while. It is control an artificial intelligence. that's like super smart and controlling everything. No idea. That's what it seemed like because sure that's did. what it is in Star Trek. Exactly. And I had the, I was like, oh my gosh, is control is control an AI? Because if, if it's an AI named Control, I need I need to see some non Star Trek AIs out there also called Control. Like I need this to be a thing that happens in <laughs> science fiction and not a a, a crossover. Yeah, so far, uh, my 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 hopes have gone from high to non-existent right. <laughs> on this. So I'm just gonna ride the ride the train that that's a there's a total crossover between these or, two at this point. Or I mean, at least for the modern day stuff that you know, Kurtzman and the people that are creating Discovery also were Babylon Five pans, and this is like their nod. Oh, yeah. You know, it's it's an homage. It's their nod back to Babylon Five rather than just like a, we're gonna steal your whole concept. That would be cool. I would like anyway. that. So I have a theory on, so we're talking about control and 13. So the psychop yeah. identified herself as 13, so, right? Mm -hmm. So this, this is 13. Do you think, so it said she was deceased. 
and I think um, I'm curious what you think. I figure it's either that that's the record they kept. Oh, she's deceased. So, you know, just like falsifying records sort of a thing, which seems like a Bureau 13 ish thing to do. Mm -hmm. Or is she also a cyber zombie who died and they plugged a thing into her brain and she's, you know, control is operating her in some way. I, I think the implication is that she is also a cyber zombie. Yeah. She's also a space zombie. I think that's the implication. Could it turn out either way? Absolutely. The writers have left that completely mm -hmm. open. Who knows where that's going to go in the future and the way it's actually going to turn out. But I think the implication and I think even the intent that they were going for right now is that, yes, she is also a cyber zombie. And this control thing is uh, at the core of it. And you controlling know? them. Yeah. What, what I want to know is what are these 13 components because it says, you know, 13 components have been deployed. And I, I swear it said to Babylon 5. Thir they're all in play. It said they're all in place and they've been deployed to Babylon 5. I may have to go back. I've only watched this one once. I have not done a rewatch mm. on it yet or anything like that. Um, but this, this 13, and I'm just sitting here going, okay, if there are 13 of these components, let's assume that these components are space zombies yeah what else could they be what else could they be at this point right so if there's 12 more of these space zombies okay here's my tinfoil hat are we now moving into uh cylon territory with these things that people interacting normally are actually space zombies might even not know that they're space zombies and how are you going to tell the difference? Is Garibaldi in reality a space zombie? Oh, wow. Has he been replaced by space zombie? Well, Maybe he was knocked out. No, he can't be replaced. But, well, I get, oh, because they got the changeling cloak things. So. Not even the changeling net thing, but he, he was out, down and out in a coma for like, what, three episodes after <gasps> he got shot in Chrysalis. Oh and yeah, so Dr. Franklin maybe is part of this Bureau 13 thing. Oh, oh he needs a little more time. That would break my heart. That would break my heart if Garibaldi oh my turned out gosh. to be a Cylon. And he didn't know it? Yeah. He was right. Because yeah. because they said if they don't just take the dead. It's the, the the mostly dead. You see, there's all the way dead, and then there's mostly dead. He, he's just mostly dead. But it turns out, it turns out his third favorite thing isn't actually tea. It's treason and insurrection at the behest of control. <laughs> I love the fact that they brought that joke back. Yeah. That was so good. Loved the fact they brought that joke back. Um, I just want to say, Jeff, with your opening statement of this whole thing, I 100% agree with you. This is the episode I needed last week, mm -hmm. to be frank. Like, I was mad at Babylon 5 last week. This is the episode I needed. Is this a great episode in the grand scheme of things? Because I, I can hear some of the, the Babylon 5 veterans being like, you guys really like this episode? Cause it's not really a great episode. Like we don't really love this one that often. I can hear people saying that. And like, this is an episode that I will simply say, if it's not a great episode of Babylon five, this is a, this is a season two sci-fi episode that is marking the growth of the show. Like yeah. the show could be way better than what this episode actually is. But this is one of those episodes that that is a step function on the right way to the show because, I mean, I tried to do the recap on this and make it smaller than it was, and I couldn't because there were so many things that they packed in, and it was, it was last week's episode didn't know what it wanted to be. Right. Remember that mm -hmm. this episode knew exactly what it was. A, a an espionage spy thriller. What the heck is going on? Why does Sheridan know all this stuff? Yeah. He collects secrets. Dude, something's up with that. Agreed. Like there's a, there's a whole, like, I like to study, you know, the, uh, the Illuminati and the, you know, Masonic lodges and the stuff. Like, oh, it's fun. It's a fun hobby to study this. Uh -huh. Then there's the person who does their own research. Right. And I'm like, which one of those is Sheridan? Because if he's just a collector and studying and stuff, cool, that's neat. People are very rarely, we've learned this, very rarely what they appear to be on Babylon 5. So 
what are we going to learn about Sheridan that's not well, so great? He said he had to pull a lot of strings to to get a name or to find out, like, what is he? He is more than just the captain of the Agamemnon who's been reassigned to Babylon 5. I need to know more about this guy's backstory. And also, I still want to know how he loses or how he gains a bunch of weight and still looks like that. I don't know. He looks great. He looks great. <laughs> he looks really good. When he's smiling, like when Ivanova's like, hey, I'll take care of the, what was it, the, the Takar thing at the beginning. He's like, ah, yeah. it's good to be captain. And he's just smiling. I'm just like, God, he looks good. Look at that. He does. He looks captain-y, doesn't he? does. Oh, my gosh. I had one last thought on um, 13, the, 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 the Psycop. Yeah. My theory is that she is Abby, the person that Talia was assigned to when she first got to Psychor, like her buddy that she was paired up with. We heard the story about. Don't you think that Talia would have recognized her from her picture or from seeing her? I think she did. Oh, I think she did recognize her. She went to the computer, like she, like in the, yeah. the mind thing, she was like, <gasps> Could it be? And then she uh -huh. went like, like how from just seeing that face, how yeah. does she go to the computer and look, if I see your face on mm -hmm. the street and then I go to Google or duck, duck, go. And I like, look up your face. I'm not going to find anything. But if I'm like, is that, is that Babylon five for the first times? Brent Allen? Is that who that is? And I go look for that. Oh my gosh. Hey, is that? Abby such and such from Psychor who became a, oh my God, yes it is. And that look on her face at the end. So I feel like we're going to have on the yeah. shadow side, the personal stake of Sheridan's wife having been killed by shadows that'll pull him in. And then on the earth, free Mars stuff side, we're going to have Talia and the tie to Abby. That's going to be her personal stake. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Maybe, maybe. I have a question about Talia. So a bunch of weeks ago, we had that episode. I forget the name of it now. It's the one where like the little girl was the telepath and she like had puberty and it manifested. And yeah, I think it was Lacey's. Yeah. There you go. And her and Ivanova, like Talia and Ivanova were like arguing over where and like Talia wanted to send her to Psychor, send her to Psychor, send her to Psychor. Didn't we have a whole episode? where Talia met an old boyfriend who came in and he was being greatly abused by Psychor. And then he like blasted her with some sort of like, I'm going to give you like all of my gift. And like, that was supposed to supposedly turn her off to Psychor and like make her like all suspicious and kind of turn her against her and, and, and raise her sigh level a bunch and all that kind of stuff. Did I imagine that episode? Well, if we did, it's a joint hallucination. I remember the thing too. <laughs> like it happened, but apparently there's no fallout whatsoever, right? My lover can get basically, I mean, he ascended and it was super cool for him, but right, you know, get chewed up, you know, run through the ringer and he tells her horrible things about Psychor and she's like, and oh, she I don't gets know. it. Yeah. yeah. And then all of a sudden, yeah, I want to send the kid to Psychor. And then right. yeah, I, I have all these great memories of growing up with Psychor. I don't remember my mom and dad at all, but like right. I had Abby. That's so cool. Right. I'd be like, I want my mom, my mom and dad can come visit. Like I, if you got to send your kid off to go something for a while, that's fine. If my kid turns out to be a mutant and Charles Xavier turns up on my doorstep one day, or if we get a letter from Hogwarts, listen, I'm going to have to go talk to the dude because you're going to have to make a special exception for me because I'm coming to my kid's Quidditch practice Yeah, and I'm going to be there for every game, you know? Like, I don't, I don't need to, uh, you know, I need to get to Diagon Alley because I'm going shopping with it. I'm going to be in the dude's life. Well, and you're not taking my kid away. Sorry, Psychor. Agreed. <laughs> yes. This isn't the Jedi Academy, you know, right? I'm not just going to train her to get slaughtered by someone who's mad he didn't get a promotion. Right. But or I think. are you? Right? Yeah. Is that what, is that what's happening? <laughs> I think with her too, on the, not just the point of like, how is she still pro Psychor, but at the end of that episode, she had the little bit of telekinesis. She moved the penny. Yeah. Right. So in this one, Abel's holding her down and she freaks out and, and she pulls the harem in gray pain, pain. Right. She says, and he's, and he's like, what are you doing lady? Come on. She should have rocked him to the ground. Given what we know from uh, what was it? mind war from mind war. That, that should have been devastating. That was the episode we met Bester. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, 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 the, and the, all the Jason Ironheart stuff and yeah. like, it's almost, it's almost like mind war never happened, 
right? We've gotten two two mentions of Bester, yeah. um, legacies, and then when um, you know, dude who shot uh, shot Garibaldi did mm-hmm. the tip of the hat thing. That's it. And then Talia is completely unchanged from that whole thing, right? Mm, kind of a letdown. I mean, if she was if she was putting on an air because she didn't want to get in trouble, or she was still investigating or something, but like. Like we, I need to have Talia do something here because they set that up very specifically and they've done nothing with it. And I'm kind of mad about it. Yeah. It's just, I mean, yeah. For a thing that sh- was huge and early, you know, we're going to introduce you to Babylon five with this mm-hmm. and then let it go. Mm-hmm. So what did we make of Talia straight up lying to Sheridan at the end of this episode? I think it ties directly to what Ivanova was saying when he was asking her. That was such a cool interaction between them when they're up in C&C and you know, he, she's like, well, you know how I feel. He, wh- what do you think about Talia Winters? Oh, she's interesting. Oh, you never talk about that. Well, you know how I feel about telepaths. Yeah, you threw one out of the third story window. <laughs> and then she's like, well, there was a pool. It's probably fine. He's like, yeah, I'm going to assume that you knew that pool was there. <laughs> Like that's the Ivanova we know. Right. That's the Ivanova we love, right? right? Just throwing somebody out of a third story window. But she said very clearly, I trust Talia Winters, but she has an unhealthy loyalty to Psychor. And boom, she proved it right there. Yeah. It's, she's gonna always choose Psychor, even though everything right. we just talked about, despite that, she's still gonna right. be team team PC. Right. And she and you know, and because Sheridan straight up asked her, like Hey, did you do this? And she looked and you're going, yes, she did. And she goes, Nope. I I need to know where that is, like what that whole what that whole piece is, uh, with with Talia. And I think part um, of it too is that I think she was thinking, again, Abby was this thing. And so she had more investigating she needed to do before she was ready to say anything. I but I as the viewer need to know that. You know what I mean? And I people out there are like, oh, just wait. I can't tell you because of spoilers. Just wait. And I'm like, awesome. Thank you. Just yeah. oh, awesome. Don't tell us because don't even tell us if it comes back around. Don't tell us if it never comes back around. I, I We'll find out and we'll, we'll get mad. We'll talk about this again later. Um, did you have a problem with Talia? Uh, Agreeing to go to dinner with uh, a Sego or a, a Soji, a Sagi, a Sagi, a Sogi. I, I feel like I'm back to uh, uh, Ivanova now, right? A <laughs> Sogi. I did, and I had a problem with him hiring her for this. Yes, I me think too. The, you know, the way it started, you know, it just kicks off. They're like, "Oh, I'm happy to see you again." Okay, great. So they've got a professional relationship. They're happy to see each other. Mm-hmm. Introduce her to Amanda. Cool. They're doing business, but then goes as far to say a father figure. I think it's a conflict of interest. And I think going to dinner with him is cool. If you're also not acting as his commercial telepath. Yeah. Yeah. And I like the note I wrote, I was like, it seems unprofessional. Mm-hmm. It might not be inappropriate for her to go to dinner with him. Cause she also is walking down the, the hallway arm in arm with him at some point now. Th- and that one really, I felt the father figure ness to that. Like it didn't feel romantic at all. That felt very, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Ivanova and rabbi Koslov. Yeah. Koslov. You know? Yeah. Like it felt very, that it had that vibe to me. So her going to dinner, like I said, not inappropriate, just unprofessional. And I think, know? I think that carried through to the end. Like I, I liked the end where they, covered for Amanda. They keep negotiating with future corp, do all these things. But Talia was so personally invested Mm -hmm. in making sure that his dream moved forward. Like she was Mm -hmm. over, she was, she was moved to hug her at the end. She was so personally moved by it. I, I don't think that she should have, I mean, there aren't a bunch of commercial telepaths hanging out on Babylon five. I get it. But Psychor has a very, very long list of very strict rules about how business is to be conducted. You'd think conflict of interest would be part of it. Can we talk about the commercial telepath though? Yeah. A little bit more. Yeah. Um, Cause first of all, I don't recall ever hearing that as the phrase that she is a commercial telepath, which to me says, and this is exactly what she is. 
her services as a telepath are commercially available. Mm -hmm. You can buy her services, but they're in a negotiation. The Mars lady and, and, uh, Sogi are in a, in a negotiation and they're talking back and forth and she says something and Talia goes, Nope, that's not at all what she just said. Da, 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 da. Like when you're in a negotiation, striking stuff, you have to play your cards close to the chest. There is a legit, like, I don't need to reveal this to you right now, or you don't need to know this. And having a telepath there feels like that is actually not a good thing to me. Like, I can understand why you might want to have that there as a negotiator, but like, I'm going, I don't know that I would agree to have one there because we just need to talk. We've like, seen the commercial telepaths run a couple times, l- uh-huh. mostly in small deals back with, right. um, I don't remember Sinclair's girlfriend's name, Catherine Sakai. Catherine, yeah. yeah. So like with dealings with her, you know, Talia yeah. was around doing stuff. I think my, my mm, problem, I guess with it, uh-huh. my wrinkle with it is there should be a telepath for both parties. Right. Like he was, that was a, or comp- she should be declared neutral or neutral. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, no, you're yeah. not. Nope. You're not. Yeah. Because it's it, it it'd be like you and I sitting down to negotiate, and me bringing a team of lawyers, and you sitting mm-hmm. there being like, "I thought I thought we were going to talk in good faith, man. Like, what's going yeah. on?" Yeah. Now that being said, I have zero problem with a guy like Captain Picard having a Deanna Troy as an empath to do the exact same thing for him. Different though, because I don't think it's like a commercial negotiation. Those are first contacts, diplomatic situations, potentially, you know, avoiding war and battle. I think the stakes are different. The, Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a reasonable expectation of, I'm not going to cover every possible base, you know, or at Mm -hmm. least transparently. Right. So I feel better knowing that it's okay for me to have a problem with the way that this, uh, this, thing works like it's not this isn't talia this is just how it works in their society like i i don't like having that in the in the way future stuff goes i don't know maybe it would actually be helpful and prevent a lot of the shadiness that happens too so i think that's part of the idea you know is like Mm -hmm. we in in the 23rd century they're not negotiating in the same way that we in the 21st imagine negotiations like there's sure more transparency maybe and hopefully a little more honesty maybe i don't know yeah. but it would yeah i think there's a better way they could approach it but i'll tell you i did i loved you, you mentioned it the the garibaldi and talia interactions in this i thought were yeah. so well done like they were they were a lot of fun that scene in the elevator when he <laughs> like she's all sad her you know her father figure just died and he's gonna hit on her <laughs> Right, like, right. Pulls a Franklin, but she <laughs> calls him on it, right? And right. and then, unlike Franklin, he gets the message, and he's like, oh, oh, you need a friend right now, so cool, I will be a friend. Like, I'll do that for you. Was he hitting on her, though? Oh, I think so. Yeah, you think so? Totally. See, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't pick up on that when they were first talking in the elevator. Like I, like this was one of those, like, it was the most sincere that Garibaldi has ever felt, uh, particularly when it comes to Talia Winters and he was, just and, and once he, like, once she let her guard down and just let him be sincere, turns out they're kind of cool with each other. I think it was after, cause he, I forget what he said, but he said something about, you know, well, Hey, I can, I can do this thing or whatever. And she was like, are you serious? Like this guy just died and. I, you, all you're hitting me with is this whatever. And he's like, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, he lost this person. I'm just being a yuck. Can you tell me what that word means? <laughs> and they're like, ha, ha, ha. Because he, he took the feed, right? He's like, oh, yeah, this isn't the time. Like, you're, you're not looking for that kind of comfort, right? I'm not going to take a page from Dr. Franklin and take you to my quarters because I feel like you need me to caress your face and kiss you, even though I'm a professional. Instead, mm-hmm. he's like, oh, okay. I hear you. You just need a friend. You need somebody to joke with. Guess what? I am the man for taking care of that. So are Talia and Garibaldi, because we have heard and we know that Jerry Doyle and whatever the lady actress name is who plays Talia, like in real life, were married during mm-hmm. the production of this. Um, is this the writers like kind of putting them together? Are they going to hook up as a, as a character set? Like, like what, what do you think? 
I've gone on the record on here a couple times on how anti ship I am. We both hate that word. Yeah. Right. But I am all for these two hooking up. It makes sense. They're not in a chain of command together. They're yep. barely even coworkers, right? They're just two yep. people that work on Babylon five and they're awesome together. Like they just I have really, fun chemistry. Listen, I have been all for the Ivanova uh, Garibaldi hookup. Like I, I really have. And I, I still think that'd be a fun one. I I'd love to see that as a relationship. Cause I think that, I think you could have a lot of fun with the dialogue and what that looks like. But I'm also all for Garibaldi and uh, uh, Talia. 100%. I think he'd be a great partner. Like he would, like he'd, he'd be a great guy to date, I think. Speaking of Garibaldi, something I've never noticed before. As a person, as a human, he has very hairy hands. Oh yeah. Oh my and God. Could you imagine how that? much does it hurt to take that thing off and on his body? Like yeah. all, also in real life, but even just like in universe, like he's got to slap the thing on and take it off. Like, like that's gotta be not comfortable. Man. I hope he gets hazard pay or something <laughs> like that. That is rough. Like, you know, does he get Corel lotion as a part of his job benefits package or something? Or I got, I have one little kind of funny thing I want to bring up and then we can start maybe talking about, um, Abel in the whole story with, sure. um, with him. But at the beginning when a and Amanda were meeting each other, right. And kind of laying their cards out on the table, he mm-hmm. says, uh, your great grandfather, John, who piloted the first colony ship to Mars would really like to see this thing happen. Did you do the math on John's name? No. Amanda Carter. So it would be John, John Carter. Carter. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it could just oh be a coincidence, God. but I was like, oh, well oh my done. gosh. That's funny. I think those, I think those were because the movie that God awful I think the movie came out just a couple years ago, but the books are pretty, they've been around a long they've time. They've been around for a while. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, was that movie bad? I always thought that movie was, I, I don't think have, I've only seen it once, but I remember like liking the movie and kind of knowing at the same time it was never going to get a sequel. I don't have good so, memories of it. I don't I, remember a lot, but let me, let me see if you can, I'm going to see if you can decipher one of my notes. Okay. Because I wrote this down and I don't remember what it means. I said, okay, the door gag was funny. Yes. Mr. Wizard. Let the wizard have a go. I do not remember what this means, but it's written in my notes for some reason. So there's a, there's a, there's, there's a way I wish this scene went down, but how it did go down was great. Sheridan had figured out that the little cyber zombie tracker thing would set off this weird kind of benign radiation and thought they could track him down with that. But I can't get these computers to find it because it's this, you know, obscure thing. And Garibaldi's like, let the wizard take over. I got this. Cause apparently he's some sort of hacker, <laughs> you know, never been a part of his character before, but he sits down, you know, does the whole like crack the knuckle things and uh-huh. sit, and he's like, Oh, you just do this cross reference to this database and the medical files. And there you go. And then the door opens and closes instead. And then he's like, Oh yep, yeah, it's more complicated than you thought it was. And he walks That's off. right. That's right. That made me laugh. Yeah. I, I thought that was the door opening and closing. And like, he goes to leave, but like, he actually has to stop and like yep. time himself up so he can get through. I that loved was- it because they called out in this one that Garibaldi and Sheridan don't have the relationship that Garibaldi and Sinclair had. So I like sure. that they're taking these moments, you know, to kind of build that. Are you good with, with this, like, like I am? with this relationship taking time to develop. Like 100%. I need to see Sheridan and Garibaldi come together, but I'm glad for that to take time. I like how they've done it where Sheridan and Ivanova have some history. So they have a place to start, but they also right. have to rebuild it because it's been years or whatever. But he and Garibaldi, you know, they don't know each other from Adam. And so they're having to build it. I really like mm-hmm. the way they're doing it. I wish though, in that scene, he would have set Sheridan aside and said, Hey, let me show you how to handle this. See, all you have to do is call mm-hmm. Ivanova and ask her to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that would have been a cool thing for him to kind of prop her up. And then I'll remind us as the viewer that, uh, Ivanova is always right. She is always right. I saw Claudia Christians and not too long ago. It wasn't last week. I don't know. Maybe it was, maybe it was a couple months ago. 
Uh, but she said something, somebody had tweeted out like Ivanova is always right. And she, as a person was like, this is some advice. I wish I would have taken more seriously when I was younger. <laughs> I was like, that's funny. That's, that's good. That's, that's a, all right. I got, I got two things before we get okay in, into, into this, the, the much bigger discussion one. Um, so in the future they have tricorders mm -hmm. yep. in this world. Oh, that's your three. Is it? Yeah, and I only have one okay. left. That's okay. I'm good. I, I'm I think actually I'm really good. I think I'm fine. Okay. Uh but they have tricord. Like huh. listen, we just said that they're in the same universe now. So exactly. So it makes sense. Yes. Of course they yes. do. Okay. I tried to call this out in my recap just a little bit, but I just I really have to point this out. So what we have is a representative of an earth based company that wants to have a meeting. With somebody from Mars, which galactically is like just right over there. And they're both going to travel across the galaxy in order to have this meeting. I'm like, that's like a toy maker <laughs> wanting to meet with the president of, of Walmart in Antarctica. Right. So that they won't be overheard or whatever. Like, why? What? surely you can find a place to meet that is not babylon 5 now i know we have the sets existing here in babylon 5 so it makes it easier but still they threw a couple words at that right like he even said he's like that's why i chose here babylon 5 to have this meeting yeah. and yeah because because it is a neutral place for all the races and everybody to come and do business but yeah it's pretty but go to io right yeah. you know i mean it's yeah. it's really it, yeah, that was that was very much about. Hey, we need to uh, we need to have, have some stuff go down with Talia here. We need to telepath around. We need it to impact people in Babylon Five. So we're going to do it there. I, I get it, plot reasons, but I yeah. was just like, that is just stupid. Because here's what we know about jump gates: it's not like um, any sort of instantaneous teleportation technology. They're like, hey, I'm just gonna pop over here and I can go across the universe and do that. Like, and it's there expensive, is, it's costly, right? And there is a time of travel from the jump gate to your point of origin or destination. Like, like that's that's not an easy necessarily uh effective yeah. way to hold. Well, it's kind of like you know, I'm up in the northwest corner of the country, you're down in the southeast corner of the country, and if we were gonna right. get together. It would make sense for us to say, hey, let's meet in the middle somewhere and do a thing. What would be stupid mm -hmm. is to say, let's meet in South Africa. Right. Like, that's just dumb, you know, and that's it's what happened here. Cool. You're on Mars. I'm on Earth. Let's meet somewhere in the middle. Io. There's a whole thing on Io, right? So, okay, mm -hmm. cool. No, let's go to the farthest point we can think of. All right, last thing for me. So... Asogi was Mars's best hope for the future. My question, was he their last best hope for the future? Well, no, because now we have Amanda Carter. She might be the last best hope, though. <laughs> and there you go. Right. He was the best hope. She's the last best hope. Yeah, yeah. All right, so let's talk about... I mean, I, what, what do you got on this, dude? You know, I, not a lot, to be honest. Okay. I think it's, it's cool. Like, uh, yeah. The, the the concept is cool. Yep. Let's take the leader of this terrorist organization, throw him in. There are obvious implications that happen from this. I thought it was, I, I appreciated a really minor callback they had in here because he, the note I took here, and this will be a deep cut for a lot of people, but the first time we see him is when Sonny roller skates past Xanadu to grab a Sogi by the throat and choke him to death, and then he heads right. off. Because Michael Beck was in Xanadu and was awesome. Okay, I'll get off that. But my immediate thought was, hey, that's what that uh, slaver Gene Simmons guy did back in Born to the Purple. Is he grabbed people and shocked them. And then when Sheridan Garibaldi were like problem solving, he's like, oh, you mean like a slaver glove? 
no, no, this is a much bigger thing. I was like, that's, oh, that's where cool. that kept, they said that. And I was like, I feel like I should know what that is. And I don't know what that is. Now I remember. Yeah. I thought, I thought yeah. that was such a ridiculous thing in that born, like he's doing what? And then they pulled it in here. I'm like, what again? Oh, cool. Okay. They're doing it. He's got Darth Vader hands. So I get it. That makes sense. But I really, he was a tool. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. they, I mean, they could have put anybody there. It led to some good dialogue between him and Amanda Carter to do some stuff. Yeah. For me, the best thing, the best thing about Abel Horn was Michael Beck, the actor. Mm. He was called on to do some ridiculous stuff, body right. seizure things and whatever. It never looked ridiculous. Like it looked, I, I bought everything he did. I honestly thought he was Brad Dorif, like the yeah. first five minutes that I saw him. And then like we got a real close up and I was like, no, that's not at all who that yeah, is. Yeah, they colored his hair or put a wig on him or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because he had that quality to him. It was really great and really well played. This is, if this was first season Babylon 5 and they threw this in here, acting would have ruined so much of this story, I think. Right. But they had, the acting was really good. And I think I think it took it... Um, I think it really took it to a higher level. But my question was, he was phase one, right? And then yeah. they said, go kill Talia because she saw it, and then we'll execute phase two. So what's phase two? And what are the other 12 elements that are out uh, there? Okay, so so let's do that here. Let's recap what we learned. Because this, this episode was obviously a bit of an information dump mm-hmm. about what's going on. Okay, so there is a Bureau 13 that is a rogue agency within earth's government and they have 13 components which we are assuming are space zombies i'm saying that it's going to turn into a human if if it it'd be awesome i think it i mean human cylon type would change the whole feel of this show, oh my I gosh think. it would and it, and i almost feel bad because i've seen battlestar galactica and it feels like it'd be that story all over again, but mm-hmm. it would be different here. I mean, you know, we called out Garibaldi earlier, like he absolutely could have been one of those people anyway. Um, oh, and rewriting Franklin mm-hmm. and that whole thing. And maybe that's why I don't like him. Exactly. I, 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 I like, would like that actually now. And he's just right. not a piece of garbage. He actually has right. a purpose. So there's Psychor. Now, Psychor has an outpost on Mars, like a big, deep outpost on mm-hmm. Mars, right? Uh, that nobody's supposed to know about. Also, they have, I'm assuming it's, Cy- this might be Psychor. Maybe it's whatever this Bureau 13, actually, I guess it is Bureau 13, but you have a Psy Cop or a former Psy Cop who is in charge of this headquarters of this Bureau 13, or she is the 13th component. I, I, I'm not entirely sure. But there's an outpost in the San Diego wastelands, which is kind of a cool concept. Mm-hmm. Um, Didn't they have look a lot a- different than San Diego does today, by the way. No, he's <laughs> <laughs> zinging them down there, man. I, I'm just going to still over here in Florida in my swamp land and, and let y'all have that over there. Um, but there's a project called Project Lazarus that Sheridan somehow knows about, which I think is there's some stuff there. And it takes dead people or almost dead people and turns them into zombies that Psycor or Bureau 13 can use to do their bidding while that body is kept in a perpetual state of reliving the moment of death. And if they start flashing out of that, they can glitch and they like shock back into it. But if things go really, really bad, then they can just self-destruct like they're a freaking, um, clone replicant replicant where you're going if, yeah, yeah th- like there's something of that nature anyway um we know that earth and there's uh, that pl- yeah and there's a plan and there's the other 12 components out there somewhere which again we are assuming are more space zombies yeah that's is that that's the only thing i can think that's the only thing i can think of i think we also know that um, the other thing we learned is that Earth government is actively trying to stifle anything that could lead to Mars independence or 
potentially bring up a thing. The mm-hmm. matriarch of the Bluth family, who apparently was a senator, thinks that she can command <laughs> Sheridan around. I loved how he yeah. stood up to her, and he's like, yeah, right. that's not my job, lady. Right. Back off. <laughs> but, yeah, that's kind of what we learned through this. And this is apparently entirely separate from the whole shadows thing, which we keep hearing about. This isn't touch on. So we're going to, we're going to get this multi-fronted thing, which I, I still am not entirely sure that I understand the political setup and nobody out there tell me because I'm sure the show is going to make it more clear. So please, you don't have to explain it to me, but at this moment in my watching of, as of season two, episode six, six, uh, I am not fully comprehending the the political association of Mars with Earth. What is your understanding of how that whole thing's working right now? I think right now Mars is a colony of Earth, so it's it's kind of yeah. a kind of a Puerto Rico situation, right? Where right totally subject to a whole lot of things. You're not represented in the in the overall government. Right. And there is a group that wants Mars to go be its own free thing. Mm-hmm. And there's obviously people who don't. And there's a provisional government on Mars, which is more than just a, sh- a puppet government set it's up very by the active. Earth Force. Yeah, yeah, very like active. They're very sense. active in doing something. So, and there's been a rebellion where they've tried to go off and get free and do their own thing. I think that's my best understanding of it right now. Just trying to put the pieces together. Yeah. And there's a lot of ties, there. a lot of ties to Mars, right? Sheridan said that he and his wife had special friends on Mars. Uh-huh. Talia had been stationed on Mars. Garibaldi mm-hmm. had been stationed on Mars. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, stake in the game yeah. for, for people there. I also think we talk about the political situation when we first saw 13 talking to control and we didn't know anything back when 13 was still Dr. Claw. Mm-hmm. We they had uh, President Clark on the TV, yeah. In there, so she was watching yeah. the news apparently, and uh-huh. he was talking about something about um, you know we're going to focus on Earth and Earth cultures to align with uh, President Santiago's vision, really right. beating that drum where I think he's trying to rewrite history. Yeah, in that hey yeah. everything everything we're doing is what Santiago wanted all right. along. Of course. Mm-hmm. One quick note on Project Lazarus. I am more and more convinced, and in fact, I'm okay with people telling me this. Mm -hmm. Mass Effect, so inspired by Babylon 5. Project Lazarus is the program that brought Shepard back at the beginning of Mass Effect. Spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't played this game, but Shepard sort of gets, he dies, he gets almost dead at the top of Mass Effect 2, and Project Lazarus rebuilds him. Very much straight out of the straight out of out of this episode. Just it worked really, really well with Shepard. Do 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 people get as mad about Mass Effect ripping off Babylon Five as they supposedly do about Deep Space Nine getting? I I am making those like I've I have never heard the two were in any way related. But I this is yeah. like the third or fourth. Dur- like there are scenes of Babylon Five that are played out in Mass Effect. Uh huh. And then stuff like this. I don't think there's so to tell us in the comments, right? Are you free, are you upset about this? Right. Like, like yeah. because if you're it, not, here I go. If you're not upset about it, then it proves my point that it's more about timing than anything else. Had Star Trek Deep Space Nine and Babylon 5 not aired simultaneously, we wouldn't still be having this conversation right now. Because mm-hmm. we're not having it about Mass Effect. Or we are, and I'm just not included in them for some reason. Right. Right. I don't know, Jeff, it feels like we're going to continue to go down this rabbit hole of uh, Deep Space Nine slash Babylon 5. But let's save that for a future episode. And um, why don't we get to that part of the show where we boil this down and actually do the Star trek thing? And see if this episode has any of that Star Trek equality. Maybe there's a deep moral message to it. Maybe it's holding up a mirror to society. Is it giving us hope for a better future? I am going to discuss my side of it. And then I'm going to rate this on a scale of zero to five deltas to see how exactly Star Trek this episode is. 
Jeff, you, on the other hand, when you're going to do your analysis, but I'm going to ask you to rate it on a scale of zero to five star furies of how much you just enjoyed this episode. Jeff, I'll let you go first. Oh, wow. Jeez. So I don't know if this was recency bias or not, right? But my initial reaction was that I loved everything about this episode. I'm like, oh, this is the best thing ever. But on my second watch, it was still super, super good. Just not as good as I, as I first thought. Yep. We're seeing some of the older Ivanova. Again, the, the, the great attitude, that swagger, that, that confidence that she has. And I loved what we got in Garibaldi. This was about, like I said, this was about reminding us about the earth and the Mars stuff and then moving it forward a little bit, introducing Bureau 13. But I really enjoyed this episode. And for me, the espionage stuff was done really well. Mm -hmm. It made sense, you know? I mean, like, I, when I watched it the first time, I felt like things were a little string, strung together and maybe didn't make sense. But on the second watch through, there were just a couple cuts that, like when Talia's bodyguard got killed it was just like oh wow that was kind of out of nowhere that that happened okay that's just mm -hmm. an editing thing but that was all fun garibaldi and talia though are what really moved this up for me without the garibaldi and talia stuff this might have been like a two two and a half for me but with that i'm gonna give this one three three star theories so this episode I think for the first time had a real Star trek -y type message to it. Um, and I'm going to fixate on a single line because I've noticed this is kind of how Babylon five does it. It sort of throws it out there and then it just leaves it and lets you pick up on it. We could talk about respecting life and what do you do with the dead bodies and, and all of that. I, I don't think that's really it. But there's a line where the senator lady talking to Sheridan, she says this. She says, practicality is more important than principles. And I went, oh, that's what this episode's going to. And she said it so early. That's what this episode's going to be about is them exploring that concept. Are your principles or better? Do your principles override the practicality of just getting it done? You know, uh, and we have seen that done and played out in Star Trek so often, you know, when, when the rubber meets the road, are you going to stick to your guns? Uh, I I'm always reminded of Kirk's words. Uh, I think it was at the end of Corbin might maneuver where he says, it's time to see if our high sounding words actually mean anything. Right. Uh, we see this happen in Voyager all the time with Janeway, like any, you and I were talking about before we went on mic tonight, like anytime the Voyager crew gets off kilter of the Starfleet values, the Starfleet principles, things go bad. It, it's the sticking to them that sees them through in the end that has held them together. Uh, certainly in next generation, we see it all the way through. We, we see this again and again, even now in prodigy, we're seeing a lot in that. Um, did they do anything with it afterwards? That's what's been running through my mind. Like, so she says this line, practicality wins out over, over principles. And, and we have to sit there and go, no, it doesn't. And this is going to show, I don't know that they showed a whole lot of principles in this particular episode. Like, again, this episode seemed to be much more of a information dump, but the fact that they brought that up gives it a lot of weight to me. And, um, I'm sure if we were to really sit here and, dissect it even more we could dive down that rabbit hole and i'm not sure if the writers intended to go there or not so i won't but i will give this one two and a half deltas because they mentioned it they brought it up i don't know that they landed the ship yeah you know what i mean they did they didn't bring it all the way home but it, they floated it out there and certainly they play i think they played with those ideas a little bit through they just never went anywhere with it to kind of they didn't give you the guy who is betraying their principles and just working on practicality and then the person who's struggling with should i or shouldn't i like we didn't have that it wasn't that clear of a thing you know so yeah i'm gonna go two and a half uh, deltas i like that i think you know especially back in the early episodes that we did we awarded some deltas based on what like our optimism 
or pessimism about what we think is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really easy to see this one being an information dump, introducing some new players and things that they have that theme. And I can very much see that Sheridan playing in that space of conspiracy junkie being where some of those themes do play out through Mm -hmm. this, this story arc where, you know, we could this, but they're doing, they're doing it this way. And and I, I can't let that happen because I believe Mm -hmm. like I could see this being the road paved for Sheridan to really drive home some of those messages. I really kept trying to find it in the Bureau 13 stuff in the, like that 13 components. Like, I, n- I didn't know if we were going to see her again later in the episode or the San Diego thing, but I, that kept running through my mind after I heard that of like this organization, whatever, whoever these people are, they're taking the practical side and we're going to see our Babylon five crew have to struggle against the principled side. Yeah. And it, it, like I said, it never really materialized. So I, I'd like, that's where I really wanted it to be, but that was, I think me trying to force it uh, admittedly. Well, with that, Jeff here in season two, we've started doing something where we are ranking the episodes. And for the first time, Jeff, something's going to have to fall out of the top five. And uh, we are going to do this. We're going to set this one. We're going to rank this episode amongst its peers. This is going to be the absolute 100% completely accurate definitive ranking of Babylon five season two. Jeff, Where are we going to put spider in the web? Currently, let me just remind us. Number one is points of departure. Number two is geometry of shadows. Number three is revelations. Number four is a distant star. Actually, the fifth spot is still blank because we kicked the long dark out last week and didn't even let it sit in the top five. This will be the first time we actually have a top five. Right. Yeah. And I'm going to put a spider in the web in spot number two, right behind points of departure. I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah. That's exactly where I was hoping you would put it because reasons. Yeah, it's a great episode, but so it's a good episode. Of departure. Yeah, yeah. It's good episode. It makes me eager to see next week's episode now. Exactly. And there's a lot and more to come. Not because I want to get this one out of my mouth. Like, I don't want to like just move on because this one sucked. Like, I'm now excited to continue on with the story. It's a good point because <laughs> I think that's where we've been the last couple of weeks. Well, Brent, that's it for a spider in the web. Next week, we get to play our game now. Next week, we are watching Soulmates for the first time. Now, we've never looked ahead. We've never seen these before. We've never talked mm-hmm. about them. No trailers, no synopses, no pictures, no anything. Based on the name alone, Brent, what do you think Soulmates is going to be about? All right. I'm going, to, I'm going to continue to speak this into existence until it actually manifests. We are due for Londo and Jakar. This is going to be a Londo and Jakar episode. I will even accept a Londo or Jakar episode, wow. although I personally prefer Londo. Um, could this be Londo and Jakar being soulmates of each other? Not necessarily Whoa. in a romantic way, not in a romantic way, but in a way that they're they're like inextricably linked together kind of a thing. Um Hopefully it's not Talia and Garibaldi, you know, uh, we, cause for both of them, we've had like somebody from the past come up yeah. like with Talia, we had Jeremy Irons and uh, Jeremy Irons, Jeremy <laughs> Ironside, Jeremy Iron, Iron Heart, Jeremy Iron Heart. Was it Jason, Jeremy? Jason, Jason. Oh my God. Wow. I Jason, I, you know, I'm what probably I'm wrong. About. I'm probably Dude. wrong on this too. <laughs> Dude who ascended. That's who yeah. we had. Yeah. And then with Garibaldi, we had uh, his ex-wife who went off and did the castaway thing where she got married to somebody else. Um, we've had both of those. So hopefully it's not like that. Uh, I do want to see a Londo and Jakar episode. And um, does maybe Londo finally finds a new. Didn't he say he already has like three wives? Maybe he finds a new wife. Is he? <laughs> oh, is there? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is there a thing in Centauri culture where like, like it, almost like Denobulans, like you get three, but in order to get a new one in, we've got to bump one of the other ones right. out and that's, you know, this is my soulmate. I've got to. And so now we get to, we get to, uh, did we meet one of the wives before? No, I, I think we saw their pictures. May, yeah. Yeah. And he, he, oh man, he loves his wives, doesn't he? Yeah. Like the, Ooh. the, 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 the like, horseman of the apocalypse. <laughs> right. Right. So that's what I'm going with. I'm going with Londo and Jakar 
but Londo has met a new girl and he's fallen in love and he's got to kick out one of his old wives to try to make room for a new one. So I feel like the more you talked, the more, the closer you were going to get to my guess. And I think we might be able to meld them together Okay. because I thought this was going to be, um, the sequel to born to the purple. And okay. Adira, yeah. who he sent off, you know, to go <gasps> yes. do stuff. Yes, her. I liked it's, her. Yeah, exactly. She was great. Yeah. I, think, I think Adira's going to come back and they're soulmates. But I want to add that onto yours that she's going to beat the, like, that's the going to be the drama is this young former slave is going to take me, a Malari wife, the, you know, and we're maybe get one of those. So we'll, we will marry our predictions in an episode we're predicting will be about marriage i and it's jakar is going to be floating around somewhere like of course, of course. that's 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 he'll be the best my... man <laughs> he's got to plan the bachelor party <laughs> you'll be the best i'll be the better man right i'll show you well that's it uh we're gonna find out next week right here thank you all so much for joining us we appreciate it more than you can possibly know if you haven't already please subscribe wherever you're listening or watching us and if you haven't already Run over to Apple Podcasts, leave us a review. I love reading your reviews here on the podcast. With that, Brent, until next time. Hey Jeff, hey Jeff. Yeah. You want to know you want to know what my third favorite thing in the universe is? Oh my god. Sure. Yeah, sure. Sure. Interrupting your closings. Oh. <laughs> you do. You're so funny. Well, hey, peace, peace and long life. This is my first time. That's All right, pretty, YouTube. That's a pretty good one. I like that. I like, I like that one. Yeah, yeah, I like that one. <laughs> I like that one. All right, YouTube. Hey, guys, thank you so much uh, for watching and joining us here at Babylon 5 for the first time. This one went a little longer than I thought it might be, but <laughs> this is, you know, I think if you take off the five, six minutes of banter that we have before the episode starts, yeah, this it's still a pretty long on. episode. Yeah, <laughs> Jeff's gonna work his magic and cut like 14 minutes out of it. So I don't know about that one. We had, we got some stuff in this one. This was a this good one. A... We it was the first time we had a good one to talk about in a while. So yeah, I'm gonna let it ride. Let it ride. Agreed. But with that, hey, listen, you guys are still watching because we know because we see the analytics. You guys are awesome. Thank you for being here. Please, if you haven't yet, subscribe because we know like half of you haven't. Um, so subscribe. And comment down below, as Jeff said, like the video, all that sorts of stuff. And uh, with that, we'll see you next time, guys. See you.